This video is about money creation. In modern economies, the money supply consists not only of currency, but also of deposits held at banks. It's for this reason that banks play an important role in money creation. Let's begin by defining the money stock we'll think about. That's the M1 definition of money supply, and it's equal to currency plus traveler's checks plus demand and other checkable deposits. Now, traveler's checks are such a small amount, we will ignore them in what follows. So let's think about how banks create money. Banks create money because we have a fractional reserve banking system. Less than 100% of the deposits are actually held on reserve. This practice arose centuries ago with goldsmiths. Goldsmiths were often given other people's gold to keep on, in safekeeping. The goldsmiths figured out that since people didn't always come and demand their gold right away, that they could actually lend out some fraction of it and make interest on it and actually make profits from that. This practice found its way into modern banking. So let's get some terminology clear first. The reserve requirement is the fraction of deposits that a bank must keep on reserve, either at the Fed or as cash in the vault. The desired reserve deposit ratio is the ratio of reserves to deposits that a bank wants to hold. This ratio exceeds the required reserve ratio by an amount that banks determine to be prudent. And let's call this RD for the reserve deposit ratio. A bank's excess reserves are its actual reserves minus its desired reserves. So let's suppose I sell $1,000 of bonds to the Fed and they credit my first national bank account with $1,000. Now it's useful to look at the balance sheet of the first national bank using a simple T account that distinguishes assets from liabilities. This transaction results in an increase in reserves of $1,000, and those are considered assets of the bank, and also an increase in deposits of $1,000, and those are considered liabilities. They're liabilities of the bank because they owe that $1,000 to me because that's my account. Now let's suppose that the bank wants to keep a reserve deposit ratio of 10%. That means it really only has to hold 10% of $1,000 or $100 in reserves and is willing to do other things with the other reserves. So you can think of them mentally splitting those reserves into desired reserves of 100 and excess reserves of $900. Now, First National Bank can use the $900 in excess reserves to make a $900 loan, let's say, to Steve. So they convert those excess reserves into a loan of $900. Now notice that both sides of the balance sheet still add up. Now suppose that Steve takes his loan, spends it at a store, which itself then deposited in its bank. Let's suppose its bank is Second National Bank. Now let's look at its assets and liabilities. Second National Bank has just had a deposit, so its liabilities are increased by $900, and its reserves are increased by $900. But Second National Bank can do the same thing that First National Bank did. In particular, if it has the same reserve deposit requirement, it can split its reserves into desired reserves of 90, which is 10% of the 900, and excess reserves of 810. What will it do with its excess reserves? Well, it can lend them out, so it can make a new loan of $810. This process multiplies through the economy with the extra amount increasing at each stage. So if our reserve to deposit ratio is 10%, an extra $1 added to bank reserves turns into the initial one plus that first loan of 0.9 plus the second loan of 0.9 times 0.9, which is 0.9 squared, plus 0.9 cubed, and on and on and on. If we add up that infinite sequence, we actually get that the $1 in reserves multiplies itself and becomes $10 of deposits. Now, how do we figure out that that infinite sum turned into that? Well, this is just a geometric series. If you have any number where the absolute value of a is less than one, then the sum from i equal to zero to infinity of a to the i converges to one over one minus a. 
In this case, our A was 0.9. More generally, bank deposits are equal to bank reserves divided by the reserve deposit ratio. So if the reserve deposit ratio were instead 0.2 or 20%, bank reserves of $500 turn into $500 divided by 0.2 or $2,500 of bank deposits. Now let's link this to M1, which includes both currency and deposits. So M1 money supply is equal to currency plus bank deposits. So M is equal to currency plus substituting in our formula up above in red is bank reserves over, reserve, uh, over the reserve deposit ratio. So quiz yourself. There's $5 million of bank reserves in Econoland. Public does not hold any currency. If the bank's desired reserve deposit ratio is 0.25, then the money supply equals 20 million. What you want to do is divide 5 million by 0.25, as we indicated in the formula, and that gives us 20 million in deposits. And in this case, the money supply, since there's no currency. So to summarize, Banks are an important part of the money creation because of the fractional banking system. The desired reserve deposit ratio is the ratio of reserves to deposits that a bank wants to hold, and we denote this as RD. And because banks can lend out their excess reserves, an increase in reserves gets multiplied into deposits. Now, the Federal Reserve System, the Fed, is the central bank of the U.S. We will discuss it in more detail later. But for now, we will discuss the most important way it conducts monetary policy. And that is controlling the money supply with open market operations. An open market purchase occurs when the Fed purchases government bonds from the public. It pays for them by crediting public's, the public's bank with reserves. This increases the money supply. An open market sale occurs when the Fed sells government bonds to the public. The public pays by writing a check, the Fed pulls these reserves from the system, and this decreases the money supply.